Well, hello. So uh, this is going to be the first of five uh, share, which will take us through, hopefully, with a bit of preparation on my behalf, uh, the whole of the Megillah. We will not go in to all of the Alshach and the whole of the Megillah because that would be impossible. It's just too long. However, uh, I will get the eager themes of the Alshach. We will pursue going through this, and I think you will enjoy this because if all the commentaries of the Alshach on any of the Sorim, I think his commentary on Urs is absolutely stunning and extremely exhaustive. He was obviously very connected uh, to the safer. Uh, just to let you know something about the al Sheikh, in case you don't already know, the al Sheikh al Sheikh is of course the Arabic word for the Sheikh. Uh, his father was called Chaim al Sheikh, so he was Moshe ben, ben Chaim al Sheikh. He was born in, so his family, his father I think, was a, originally from uh, Spain and they fled um, uh, from the, so 1492, round about that, that makes sense, to Turkey and they lived in a place called Adri, Adri, Adrianople. Adrianople, or I think that's how you pronounce it, originally created by the Emperor, Roman Emperor Hadrian. Um, and that was where he settled. And from there, of course, he went to Sfas. Uh, Sfas, he became the Avbastin of Sfas. He was one of the few people given real smicha in the whole smicha controversy by Rabbi Yosef Karo, uh, the author of the Shokan Oracle, of, of course, was his Rebbe, his main Rebbe. He was a teacher. He was also a Talmud, sorry, I should have said, of Ramosha Cordovero, the author, the Kabbalist and the author of Talmud Devorah and other works. Um, and he was the teacher of the Arizal, his Gomorrah teacher, and of Rechaim Vital, amongst others. Uh, he spent most of his time on Gomorrah. Gomorrah was his first love. After that, Halacha, and he only had a chance to look at the Madrashim on a Friday afternoon, he wrote, uh, which allowed him to give the shear in, in the show on Shabbos afternoons, which eventually became the al commentary on the, on the Chumash. Not very uh, well uh, commonly learned, because his style is to ask lots and lots of questions and then go into the analysis of those questions. And a lot of people don't have the, the patience to work through his razor sharp analysis of the text. But for the al every single dot, every single letter counts. And he is with his complete mastery of all of the sources, explains exactly why a letter is written, maybe without a vov when it should have a full vov, uh, maybe in the masculine when it should be in the feminine, maybe in the singular when it should be in the plural, and gives you an insight as to exactly what that means. He, he uses those techniques extensively in his commentary on the uh, commentary on on Rus. And just as a as a matter of interest, I thought you might be. I think some of you who participate in this year regularly might already know this. Here is this is given to me by Talmud, whom I learned Al Shukluth, uh, and he bought this for me. And he bid for this online. And this is a com this is a copy of a first edition of the Al Shukluth and the al its commentary on, uh, on the Prophets, the Nevi'im. It was printed in Venice in, um, in uh, believe it or not, 1603. So I'm holding something in my hand, which is over 400 years old, uh, covered in pigskin. Um, that was very common, and no halachic problems with that, covering Jewish books in, in pigskin. Um, and it was printed by the, the al own son. Uh, so he undoubtedly held this in his hand. Uh, how many, after all, did they print in those days? It was owned, you can see the signature at the beginning of the book, by somebody called Rabchia Pontrimoli. Pontrimoli. Uh, Pontrimoli is a very interesting name. It's the, also the name of a town in Italy, and it means um, shaking bridge. Pont, as in French, pont, uh, meaning a bridge. And tremoli, from tremble, I suppose, or tremolo, uh, meaning to shake. A more poetic translation would be, I suppose, uh, shivering bridge, something like that. Um, it's a, there's a bridge there, it was over a river. Uh, I'm not sure if I'd love to, like to be crossing a bridge, which is a shaking bridge, although all bridges, bridges do shake, as we know. Okay, that's the story. Uh, it gives us a bit of a feel of who we're talking about. Um, and, uh, and if you're interested, um, uh, Andrianopoli is, uh, is just in northern Turkey, just in mainland Europe, and it's just at the, very near the Bulgarian border. So that's where the Alshik was born, before he moved down to Sfas. Okay, so let us, uh, if you have uh, a Megillus Rus in front of you, that would make life extraordinarily easy um, because uh, otherwise it's, it's going to be difficult. Um, however, I will do most of the, of the reading and the translation, all of the reading and translation, uh, and it'll give us a, a, an insight as to exactly what this story is all about. It is full of some of the richest and interestingly most Kabbalistic ideas 
um, that are, co are, are commonly accessible, uh, unless you're a, a, world, a world expert in Kabbalah. And uh, those who are really world experts in Kabbalah don't reveal the fact, which is why I keep quiet about it. Okay, so in Megillus Rus, it starts off at the beginning, and it says, Vayhi be meshrot hashoftim. And it is, it was, when the, in the days when the judges judged, Vayhi ra'ov ba'aretz, and there was a famine in the land. Vayelich ish, and a man went, me beis lechem Yehuda, from Bethlehem in Yehuda, Lagur, to temporarily stay, um, but stay Moab in the fields of Moab, who ve ishtar shnei of him and his wife and his two sons. So I see if you've got that in front of you, that will make the study of this much easier. And I should have said that really at the beginning. Maybe I shall uh, uh, mumble on for a little bit while people quickly grab them. However, uh, there is two important points before we analyze the text through the eyes of the Alshir. And that is the word vayhi that begins at the beginning of the, or the first word of the Megillah. Vayhi, whenever it says vayhi, the Talmud tells you something bad is going to happen. It's telling the story is, is set in sad or bad times. And so therefore it says, Vahi be mishvot ashoftim, Vahi ra'ov ba'aretz, and there was a famine in the land. Why does it say a second Vahi? Um, so you could say, well, it's telling there was a famine in the land, and that's what the bad thing is. But then we've got a problem with the first Vahi. What does the first Vahi refer to? So the Alshik says something interesting. He says that the first Vahi is telling you, it tells you what the bad thing was. Certainly the second Vahi says there was a famine in the land. Fine, I get why that's bad. What's the first Vayhi? Let me read it again. Vayhi be mesh fota shoftim. And it was in the days when the judges judged. And then Vayhi ra of Baruch. And it was a famine in the land. So if we know that the second Vayhi refers to the famine, that's obvious. What does the first Vayhi refer to? And the Alshur says, Vayhi be me shafot a shoftim. It's a verb. It was the days when they judged their judges. Now, what that means is quite simply that we all know the second paragraph of the Shema contains a contract or an explanation of the contract between God and the Jewish people. Existence um, consistently in the land of Israel is predicated on keeping the laws. The second paragraph of the Shema says, And it will be if you keep my laws. Then you get to live in the land that will give its fruit at the right time and there'll be tremendous produce and, and you'll live in peace and security in the land. That's if you keep the laws. But if you don't keep the laws, then as the, as the second paragraph of the Shema goes on to say, then it could be, if we carry on our Italian theme, Arvidarci, it could be goodbye. And indeed, historically, the Jewish people have severed that link to the, to the land of Israel through not keeping the laws, which is the condition for being there, um, several times. Now that's crucially important. In the Sedra itself, which is called Shaftim, it says and tells us that we've got to set up law, Torah law, and courts to carry out the Torah law throughout the land of Israel. The Torah has to have Dayanim and base teams and law officers to defend it uh, throughout the land of Israel. And Rashi says there an int inc incredibly interesting point when it says, appoint judges, if I remember rightly, the appointment of kosher judges, and of course, there can be judges who are corrupt and not kosher, that the appointment of kosher judges in and of itself is enough to keep the Jewish people living in the land of Israel. Of course it is, because the appointment of kosher, frum, serious, scholarly, Talmudic judges who are Yuri Shemaim, fearing God, and Sadiqim, is an, is an exercise in carrying out what the, what the second paragraph of the Shema says that the land of Israel is secure for us by the fact that we keep Torah law. By appointing judges who carry out Torah law in its purest form, we're making it quite clear that's exactly what we want to happen. But if the Pesach says that it's the day when they judged, it was days when they judged their judges, it was a period of the anarchy and rebellion against Torah law and those who carry it out, then there's clearly a weakening of the contract, or tearing up of the contract, and a weakening or a severing, severing of the bonds that keep the, the Jewish people in the land of Israel. So the first Vayihi produces the second Vayihi. The second Vayihi, a famine in the land, is the outcome of the first Vayihi, and that's because they no longer kept, the, they never kept, they no, stopped keeping the laws and wanting kosher judges to uphold those laws. They judge their judges. And then if there is a famine, there's a very interesting statement in the Gomorrah. Ra'av ba'ir, if there's a famine in the land, 
Pause a raglecha, says the, says the Gemara. It scatters feet. Two types of crisis. If there is a famine, then, or if there is a war. If there is a war, the enemies approach from the borders and people retreat inside the land, within the land. But if there's a famine, it has the reverse effect. People leave the land. So therefore, this exodus is going to be provoked by the fact there's a famine. People will leave. God is emptying the land of Israel because you only get to live there in the first place because you're going to keep the laws. So that's the, that's the, as it were, the background um, of the whole story. Vayilach ish, and then it says. So having established that, and then says, Vayilach ish me beis lechem Yehuda. And a man goes from beis lechem and Yehuda. If you come from beis lechem and Yehuda, that means you're from the tribe of Yehuda itself. Lagor beste Moav. To temporarily stay in the fields of Moav. Hu ve'ishto shnei banav. He and his sons, and his two wives. Oh, sorry, his wife. Sorry, I can't read this wrong. Hu ve'ishto, he and his wife. Hu shnei banav, and his two sons. That's what I meant to say. Now, this is very interesting. The Elshik points out, why doesn't it say, and a man and his wife and his two sons went? Instead, it splits them up. He, he goes, and it tells you where they come from. And then his wife and his two sons. So let's look at that strangely fractured posset again. It says, Ve'yelach ish, and a man went. Should have said his wife and his two sons. doesn't do that. But it tells you where he comes from. Beis lechem Yehuda. Lagur to temporarily stay in the fields of Moab. That should have been where the Possek writes it. But instead, it then goes back to where it should have said, Who Who and his wife and his two sons? So why does it split them up? And the answer is a very interesting answer. Here's the Jewish philosophical idea the al express expresses, a theological idea, an idea of Midas, of basic humanity. And that is to say, when people are suffering, you cannot be insensitive to their suffering. Even if it's not you that's in pain, the fact that other people in pain are in pain, that should affect you. Now, when Noach goes into the, into the Teva, then the Torah reports that At Noach is in, and then his sons go in, and then Noach's wife goes in, and then his daughters-in-law go in. When they come out, it says Noah and his wife, Noach and his wife, and his sons and their wives. But in putting them in that way, it's, it splits them up. Noach and his sons, Noah's wife, and then the daughters in law So the men are separated in that formulation from their wives. Because when people are drowning and dying outside, even if they deserve to die, but for you to carry on normal married life, husband and wife together and being together, when other people are drowning, that shows an incredible insensitivity. Don't forget Hashem himself said to the Jewish people who were singing in celebration at the drowning of the Egyptians, uh uh, wrong. My creations are dying and drowning. Oh, but of course they deserve to, or God wouldn't be doing it in the first place. But I would have rather that he did teshuva, so I didn't need to do this. So don't celebrate. Same with the, with the people who drowned outside the ark. Hashem gave them a long time through the agency of Noah to do teshuva. He wanted them to do, but he didn't want us to have to do this. So don't be insensitive to their suffering as though it doesn't matter. It matters. It impacts on you. You can't see people suffering and not be impacted on it. Interestingly, I was just standing today in Shari Chaim um, of, uh, of Rechaim Vital, one of the al in Talmudim. He says that somebody who is a chosid, a chosid is a madriga higher than a tzaddik, loves people, loves people whether they're Jewish or non-Jewish. These are creations of a Hashem There's no celebration. When any human being dies, there is in trouble. So therefore, it splits them up here as well. It says who, and then it says the Ishto and Shnei He is separated from his wife because he was separated from his wife. People are outside and people are drowning or dying of hunger. Uh, then you can't carry on normal married life or carry on normal life when people are drowning if you're not outside the ark. And there's another incredibly important thing here that the Alshik points out, and it's very acute very well observed. It says that they come from Beis Lechem Yehuda, and it says they came to temporarily stay in the field of Moab. Now, at this point, if I were to ask you the, the, the obvious question, what was the, who was this fellow, who was his wife, and who was his two sons? Well, the answer is, unless you've read the book before, and we have, of course, is you don't know, or at least the posset doesn't allow you to know. The first posset doesn't inform you. It does in the second. So why doesn't it in the first? 
And the answer is very simple. Hashem sent along a famine in order to get people to leave. So are they doing anything wrong in leaving when Hashem sends along a famine to get them to leave? Well, no. Not at that level. Although there's much to talk about that in actual fact, the man who leaves, who, as we know from the next possible, is Eli Melech, the greatest rabbi of his generation, and his wife and his two sons, who were all great tzaddikim, uh, were doing something wrong by leaving when the people who are behaving badly and rejecting Torah law and directing uh, and rejecting Dionim, um, they're still staying. They may have rejected Torah law, but they have one thing that still is a constant in their love for the land of Israel. There are Jews who still remain attached to their land. And the Alshik says that that attachment, even if they let everything else down, was enough to be able to sustain them in the land until um, they got the message and things turned around when the famine ends. So there's something to say about Elimelech leaving. However, at the, at the very basic level, he's not done anything wrong by leaving the land of Israel to temporarily stay in the fields of Moab. And the Alshik says, notice the, that the field is in the plural. He temporarily goes to stay in the fields of Moab. Where is Moab? So Moab is, of course, today called Jordan. So across the Jordan River, you come to Moab. It is lush, and it is green and verdant, and that's where, of course, the majority of the agriculture of the, of the Jordanian state today and their economy is uh, created from. Interesting to note that the famine stops. Now, of course, it's, it's one flow. There's a river separating the two. Um, but the, this famine was a spiritual famine or a spiritually inspired famine. The famine only exists in the land of Israel, not outside it, just across the, towards the north of Israel. The Jordan River is extremely narrow. Uh, it didn't, wasn't a, a, some sort of pestilence that affected the crops. It's specific to the land of Israel because God sent it. He wants the Jews to leave. It doesn't affect the, la the land of Jordan, just inches across the border uh, from, from Israel. So they go there to where they can get food, a reasonable, a reasonable response. Um, and they intend to stay in the Moab. Sade, a sade is a field. They're going to stay in the fields. That's a bit of a, hmm, not such a good place to be uh, living in a field. Um, but they also says fields, uh, sade is a euphemism for cities. So they went to stay in the cities of Moab, which obviously raises the question, why don't they go and stay in a city in Moab? Right, a man, uh, as a man, the capital of Jordan, not a human being. A man, they could have, I mean, assuming it was called a man in those days, but they could have lived in, the, in one city. Why, why, why are you going from city to city? And the answer is that they too love the land of Israel. And out they go, and they are going to make sure that they return. They're going to make sure they return by not putting down roots. Um, I think once in our share in, in the past, um, for those who are regulars um, in my share, I may have told you the story um, of once I was sitting at uh, Tel Aviv Airport back in the day when my oldest son, who was near, now nearly 40, was just a baby. We were sitting opposite one of my great teachers, Rabalta Halpen, uh, his daughter in law. We didn't know it was his daughter in law at the time. Um, and this young lady also had a baby at the same age as our baby. So my late wife and I were sitting opposite her, and when we discovered who she was, we had lots to talk about. And uh, she told, told us a very interesting thing. She had married her husband, and they'd gone to settle in Eretz Yisrael, and if I remember rightly, they were staying or living in Petah Tikva, in the you know, greater Tel Aviv area, Petah Tikva. I think the first uh, Yishuv, the first new Yishuv uh, when, uh, in the 19th century, when Jews started to go back to the land of Israel. Anyway, so basically, uh, they couldn't make ends meet. They just couldn't make it there. So they come back to settle in London to earn, to buy some property, earn enough money. Of course, his property almost doubles in price in, in, in North London every couple of years anyway. That would allow them to make enough of a profit to be able to settle back in Petak Tikva by, by their apartment outright and be able to make it in the land of Israel. And she said something which is very interesting. Uh, my husband, where we're living, it's a wreck. The house we're living in, it's a a churban, it's a, it's a mess. Uh, my husband wants to do it up, but I won't let him. And then she said this crucial sentence, because if we do it up, if we decorate it and repair it, it'll stop being a house and it'll become a home. 
And then she said, and we don't want that. To, I don't want that to become our home. This is our home. So that's a very interesting idea. Uh, you, once you start to, as it were, feel comfortable in Chutzla Oretz, it's very difficult to uproot and go back. And that's why here they go from place to place. They go from New York to Boston, and then from Boston they move to Baltimore, from Baltimore to Chicago, very cold in Chicago, Los Angeles, etc., uh, etc. Et or if you're watching this in England, they move from Leeds uh, to Manchester, uh, Liverpool. Um, you get the idea. London. Um, and, and that's they're not putting down roots. So therefore they've done nothing wrong. right? They've left because there's a famine. People are meant to leave under the famine. That's why Hashem sends a famine in the first place. They don't go to permanently stay out there. And they've separated. The husband and wife are separated. They're not living a normal married life, ignoring the suffering of the Jewish people back in the land of Israel. But then by the second posseg, there's a very interesting change to the wording of the posseg. Let's watch that. Second posseg. Hoshem Ha'ish. Now again, sorry, I interrupt myself just to say, remember that the Alshuk notes any dot, any... Uh, letter that's extra, uh, and he always asks the question, why is it written that way? Because Hashem is good at Hebrew. The, the Sefer was written by Shmuel, incidentally, and he was a Navi, so it's dictated with through a Kakaidish and by an inspiration by Hashem himself. Look at Posset Base. Oh, that fellow we were talking about before, we didn't name him. Oh, he was called Elimelech. His wife was called Nomi. And the name of his two sons was Machlon Bechilion. Ephrotim, who are Ephratites. Um, we'll translate that properly next week, but we'll translate the, use the simple translation, they were aristocrats. Mm. All right. Me Beislechem Yehuda, from Beislechem and Yehuda, Beivoste Moab, Beyusham. And they came to the field or the cities of Moab, Beyusham, and they were there. Now, another interesting thing about the Alshak is, for all the greatness that I told you about him, I don't know what that conjures up in your mind, a Kabbalist, a, the Avbastin of Sfas, uh, a, a huge Tom and Chacham, a Baal Halacha, etc., etc., etc. But he was also a very normal person with a sense of humor. And his sense of humor in his commentary comes out again and again and again. And here he says, they came to the fields of Moab, they came to the cities of Moab, and they were there. Could they have come to the cities of Moab and been somewhere else? What does that say that for? They came to the fields of Moab and they were there. As they say in America, duh. Of course they were there. Or, <laughs> how could you come to the fields of Moab and not be there? So he says something tremendously interesting. He says um, that when they come to the land, outside the land of Israel, and they go to Moab, they've done nothing wrong because they are going from place to place to place to not put down roots. But by the second pasuk, the Megillah is testifying to the fact that things have changed. Now they have uh, done up the house. Now, now they've decorated and rebuilt. Now they've put down roots. They came to the fields of Moab and they were there. Now they were there. Now they put down roots. And as a consequence of that, now they've done something wrong. It didn't reveal who they were in the first posse because they've not done anything wrong. But by the second posse, they have made a big mistake. They've taken the first step to permanently stay out of the land of Israel. And indeed, for three of them, it's going to be permanent. Because three of them are going to die there. But we'll get to that soon. Shema Ish was Elimelech. And the man was Elimelech. Oh, the greatest rabbi and halakhic authority of his generation. And the tzaddik. Shem Ish was Nomi, and his wife was Nomi. And Shem Shebon of Machlon the Chilion, and the name of his two sons was Machlon the Chilion. And that's going to give us a bit of a head scratching very soon. And if not this week, certainly next week. Because you undoubtedly come across somebody called Nomi. Nomi is a very common name. Eli Melech? Yeah, I know some uh, Eli Melechs as well. Uh, and you probably have come across an Eli Melech or two. Have you come across a Machlon or a Chilion? The answer to that is de definitely no. You'll never come across anybody called Machlon or Chilion. These are extraordinarily weird names. Jews are very, very sensitive to names, and we spend a lot of time putting, and it's one of the great excitements of the arrival or the soon-to-be arrival of a child, is finding the right name for that child. Um, hmm. Machlon Bechilion. Well, uh, let's start with the second son. So Machlon's the first son. Come to him in a second. Uh, Chilion. The Alshik says, what does the name Chilion mean? Eli Melech. I mean, things mean, names mean things in Hebrew. Eli Melech, Eli Melech means God is my king. Right? Eli Melech. Um, or to me, is a God is king, uh, perhaps. 
Shem Ishtar was Nomi, it means pleasant. And we're actually going to say that, well, it's going to be very crucial in our third share, or maybe second, depending how I, I pace this, that Nomi was not really her name. It was people, the name that people gave her, or maybe it was both. But she, in other words, she was Nomi by name and Nomi, Nomi by nature. She was extraordinarily pleasant. As we'll see later, she was a Tzedekah who was possessed of Ruach HaKadosh, of divine inspiration. But the name Chilion, so you meet somebody, a friend of yours, and you know that he's had a baby. He was a baby boy. So I'm very sorry. I uh, haven't seen you for two weeks. Have you had the breast? Yes. What did he call him? And he says, Chilion. The Alshur says it comes from the word Kalia. Kalia means exterminate or destroy. What did he call your son? <laughs> exterminate. What? Chilion means exterminate. Machlon means forgiveness. Still never heard of it as a name but it actually means forgiveness. But the question is that both these sons have very, very, or the point is that both these sons have very different fates. One is forgiven and one is wiped out completely. But as I told you before, both actually die. So in what sense is one forgiven and one wiped out? What's that talking about? We'll get to that shortly. There were aristocrats and they come from Beis Lechem Yehuda um, and they put down roots in the field of Moab. And straight after that, it says the following thing. Now there's no, there's no uh, preamble to this. There's no build up to this. As soon as it ends up telling us, they came to the field of the Yusham, and they were there. And they put down routes, Elimelech's gone. He dies, or Hashem takes him back to heaven. So the question is, what did he do wrong? For the God of Hadar, to put down roots and stay outside the land of Israel, particularly when he is one of the richest human beings in history, um, who could have helped through the famine, that's considered to be unforgivable. And it's not the normal formula by which Hashem gives a person a grace period, an extension of um, forbearance in the hope the person does to shoot him. This is just unforgivable and he, his life is snuffed out straight away. And then it says Ishnomi. Now the Alshak says something very interesting here. Vayomas Elimelech Ishnomi. Before it said Elimelech, or it says Shem Ish, Shem Ishtoi. And then again, second positive, the Shema Ish was Elimelech, Shem Ishtoi. And the name of his wife, being the wife of the greatest uh, rabbi of the generation, of course, uh, your renown is through your husband. One of the nicest things you'll ever come across in your life is uh, when uh, people start to say, well, I think it's nice if people say about you, to your children, are you, in my case, Rabbi Rubenstein's children? That shows that maybe you've made a, some sort of uh, impact and, the, and hopefully your children get nachas. Kfel is the Yiddish word is from that. But there's an even better stage, which uh, certainly in a couple of my case, of children cases, uh, um, actually come to think of quite a few, certainly one, they say, are you? And they mention one of my sons name, his father? In other words, now it's reversed. Now my son, a son who is such a, a, a well-known rabbi and respected and made already as a young man, uh, quite a name for himself, that uh, now people are, wow, you're his father? No, it's not the other way about. So sometimes a person is known by, or his family is known by the father, and sometimes the father by the, uh, by, by the children. Same with the husband and the wife. Um, you get two great people. It can be, are you Avram Avino? Are you Sora's husband? Are you equally, you could say to Avram, um, uh, are you, are you Sora's husband or Sora, are you Avram's wife? It, because they're both great. At the beginning, it says, in the, in the first boss, it says, the name of the, the uh, Shemo Ish was, sorry, pause the base, Shemo Ish was the Melech, the Shem Ish Donomi. Then her renown was the fact that she was his wife. But by the second post, it says, the Yomas Elimelech Ishnomi. Elimelech is now known as the husband of Nomi. Before, her, her renown was being married to him. Now, whatever greatness he has, it totally depends on his wife. Having stayed outside the land of Israel, his, his good name has been uh, demoted, arguably demolished. And the, the, her greatness is the one that's going to, as it were, shine in him. Well, his greatness shining on her. Interesting idea. 
Well, one of my very good friends is somebody called Ramosha Kupas, who's also in Rufur Shlomi, he's not very well. He's son-in-law of the late uh, great Tzaddik, the Manchester Rosh Hashiva, uh, Rabbi Siegel, Tzaddik Tzaddik Evrocha, who I have the enormous privilege of knowing and being close to. Um, and Ramosha and I were working for many years together in, in Manchester. And he once asked me, he's got a fabulous sense of humor, and he once asked me something with a big smile on his face. He said, how rich would a Jew have to be to marry into the British royal family? Interesting question. How rich would you have to be? Well, um, the answer is obviously enormously rich. But that is absolutely nothing compared to the amount of money and how rich you would have to be to marry into the Moabite royal family. Bearing in mind the Moabites hated the Jews with a vengeance, um, then you'd have to be incredibly wealthy. And indeed, they were incredibly wealthy. And then we come to the, the head scratching thing that I told you about before about Machlon Bechilion. It quickly looks at the, the clock. This will set us up very nicely for next week. Let's look what it says next. So we've got now the death of the father. So we've got a mother left. And indeed, the Alshik says, the Yom HaTel HaMelech Ish Nomi, the Tishor He Ushnei Baneho. The Tishor He Ushnei Baneho. Tishor means, and they were left over. And there was a residue, almost as though they were, the implication in the Hebrew is, they deserve to die as well. And Nomi, indeed, should have, says the Alsha, got out the frying pan, um, and got out the rolling pin, which is sometimes the role a, a, a Jewish wife has to play. If you think about the, the interactions between two of the greatest Jewish women of all time, which is Sari Imenu and Rivka Imenu, their role towards their husbands was very different. Rivka was in awe of her husband Yitzhak, who was willing to be offered as a sacrifice at the binding of Isaac um, to Hashem. And therefore, when she intervened or opposed her husband's view, when he wanted to give a blessing to Esau, it was, as they say in Yiddish, still a height. It was subtle. It was not a, a, a face on confrontation. Not so sorrow. But sometimes um, a wife has to make a strong stand against a husband. And there is a, a suggestion in the Hebrew that really she deserved to die as well for not forcing her husband to go back to the land of Israel. But she has a role to play, a crucial role to play, which is in the, the journey of Rush, who after all is going to be the mother of the Mashiach, which is what we're going to be spending a lot of time dealing with in the weeks to come. And she is left over, and her two sons. They should go back to. But then it says, And the boys, these young men, marry Noshim Avias. Now, the Alshach wants to emphasize they were also Tzadikim. And he brings proof to that, which we won't go into now. Just take my word for it, because I want to get to a crucial observation. The Noshim Avias, they marry Moabite women. Shema Achas is Orpa, the Shema Shenish is Rus. And the same, the name of the second one was Rus. Now, this is very intriguing. The name of the first one was Orpa, and the second one was Rus. Um, mm -hmm. The Alshik wants to know, why did it say, the name of the first one, and the same of the second one? Why not just say that the, the, uh, married two, Jew, two uh, Moabite women, Orpa, but Rus? Why does it emphasize the name of the first one and the name of the second one? Let's say Orpa, but Rus. What's the first and second got to do with it? And then we come to the, what happens to them? The Yeshu Shom, and they're allowed to live there for 10 years. But you must have gone and they also die. Machlon the Chilion. And they die too. Why did they die? So we've already seen that they got a free pass um, and should have died when the father died, but didn't. But then they go and they marry these two, these two women. Now, what caused their deaths? So there's a great deal of debate amongst the commentators. Was it the elite because they stayed out of the land of Israel or married out? Now, we're going to explore that in our next week's share in more depth. But one thing is absolutely certain. Whether they stayed out or whether they married out, if that is the accusation, they both did the same thing. And yet one is forgiven, machlon, and one is finished, and that's Chilion. The name points in that direction. But why if they both did the exact same thing? And the answer is very simple. Who was married to who? So we get two 
non-Jewish Moabite princesses, sisters. Orpah was the first one. And she was married to whom? She was married to Chilion. And Rus was the wife of Machlon. Now, who was the older brother, Machlon or Chilion? Well, if we think back to the first, uh, the second Pesach, it says, the name of the man was Enemelech, the name of his wife was Nomi, the name of his two sons was Machlon the Chilion. The oldest son was Machlon. The second son was Chilion. Machlon is married to Rus. Here it says, they marry Moabite wives. The name of the first one, that's why I emphasize the first one, is Orpah. And she was married to Chilion. Chilion is the younger son. You might have thought that the older son would have married at first, but he didn't. The younger son marries out, if we're going to say that, although we'll talk about that in more depth next week. He marries out first. And by marrying out first, there is a general rule in Judaism which goes like this, Ashkofa. You're not as guilty if you are led astray by somebody else. If somebody, as it were, breaks through the fence, the boundary, bound, uh, in, what's the word? It is the boundary of Jewish philosophy, Jewish perspective, Jewish, mor Jewish morals, ethics, halacha. By breaking that down that fence, it makes it easier for people to also fall through the hole that you've, made, that you've cut. So Machlein, the older son who didn't marry at first, is weakened in his resolve not to marry out by the second one who does, and therefore you are by, as it were, not only did you marry out, you caused your brother to marry out, that's your third, three strikes and you're out. You stayed at the land of Israel, you married out, and you caused your brother to marry out. So you're finished. But Machlon is going to have, in, is going to be forgiven. And now we're actually out of time, that's 45 minutes. And we're going to come back to that next week. How was he forgiven? Because he comes back. As we know, the Torah, uh, uh, certainly the Alsha, maybe we'll keep it like that, not to getting into debates about somebody called the Rashash, who strongly denied the idea of reincarnation. But the al in in fact, as far as I know, everybody else, says that reincarnation, Gil Gulnashamas, is a, a fundamental part of Jewish belief. And Machlon is able to come back and start again and repair the damage that he did in the previous life. How did he come back? Well, when Rus marries Boaz at the end of the story, and of course he dies, um, they don't even have a day together, uh, but she becomes pregnant from the first night of marriage. Then she has a, a son called Ovid. And the soul inside Ovid was Machlon, Rus's dead husband from her first marriage. That soul came back, reincarnated in the baby that his wife would give birth to, who was called Ovid. That was Machlon. He was forgiven. We'll get into that in more depth next week. I hope to see you there as we go deep into the Alshuk's analysis of Megiddo's